Rania, um, most people when they look at you would not think that you're Palestinian because we have this image that you know conjures up in our mind when we think of Palestinians. Tell me a little bit about your story. Where do you come from? Uh, not only do they not know that I'm Palestinian, often I'm also told you don't look like a Muslim, so it's sort of a, a double uh, whammy that way. Uh, originally, uh, my father's from Tiberias, and he left uh, around 1948. Uh, he came to the States as a 16-year-old in the 1950s and landed in Chicago. Uh, ended up majoring in math and engineering and graduated from the uh, University of Illinois, Champaign. Uh, and um, my mother is from Ramle, and she uh, was very young in 1948, and her father was a civil engineer, and he ended up being employed in Kuwait. And uh, so my background, if you will, has my father going back uh, to the oil-rich Gulf states seeking a job as a young man uh, at around the age of 26, 27, falling in love with my mother, meeting her in Kuwait, uh, having starting their family. I also grew up in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. So they didn't have an arranged. So they didn't have an arranged marriage. That oh most no, would think it of. was not at all. In fact, he, as an engineer, a civil engineer, he was working on uh, a road uh, uh, next to her home, and he would uh, watch her going in and out of uh, the house often, and, and he fell in love with her. So uh, yes, and they were eventually introduced by a mutual friend. And then you came to America, obviously you went to school here, and what was that like? I mean, your whole sort of journey as being a Palestinian, a Muslim, you know, living in America, what was, what was that like? I permanently arrived at the age of 16, but prior to that my father had um, bought a small home in McLean, Virginia, and so I grew up watching reruns of uh, I Love Lucy and I Dream of Jeannie and Father Knows Best. Um, so I was quite familiar with the uh, American uh, experience in terms of its cultural, uh, the, the cultural uh, aspect of it. Um, when I finally ended up at Georgetown University, I um, fell in love with the American dream. I fell in love with our founding fathers because as someone who, as a Palestinian, I never did really enjoy the security of absolute citizenship. So I, we were very much at the whim of uh, working permits and visas, and so I very much took to heart the the values, the, the values of the American dream and the protection it affords its most recent immigrants, and uh, it's been a love story since. <laughs> and then you must have fallen in love with your husband because you married Sammy. That's true. We <laughs> fell in love. We first met at the Washington Harbor. So you weren't arranged to be married either, No, right? no. No one in my family has really okay. um, been arranged. It's not a tradition. We've, in fact, uh, none of the women I can identify have ever worn a headscarf. My grandmother uh, wore a bathing suit and sw uh, swam in Lake Tiberias way back when. Mm -hmm. um, and so we come from a long line of progressive Muslim women. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to do this examination of your life to see how did you go from being a typical immigrant coming to this country, you know, going to school, falling in love, having two beautiful children, living in Manhattan, you know, a wonderful life, and then all of a sudden you're writing books. What was <sighs> the inspiration? What happened? I was uh, a PhD candidate. I was more political than religious. My interests sort of fell in that uh, field, but uh, I I feel like uh, before 9-11, I would call us accidental Muslims because ultimately I think many of us are perhaps of a certain religion uh, through an accident of birth. And I think what 9-11 did was, uh, and I'm not alone that way, I think it did that to many American Muslims, it uh, sort of forces you to grapple with the notion of what it means to be America. Islam, after all, after 9-11 was on trial. and. Yep. Um, every talking pundit on TV uh, was an expert suddenly and you were told that uh, you can be a woman and be a Muslim and you needed to be liberated from it, that violence of Islam was inherent to the theology of Islam. So there was a lot coming at me and as a mother of uh, a toddler at the time uh, and two, two children, when uh, my daughter was starting kindergarten, I very much was worried about the future of my children as American Muslims and I thought, well, 
if uh, being Muslim is just a label or it's something that we are as a family because of a sort of ancestral loyalty, then why put them through that challenge? It had to be more, and hence the beginning of this journey. So <coughs> the terrorists blow up two beautiful buildings in our city, our state, our country. And what is the impact on a person like you, who's living a comfortable life in Manhattan? What impact does that have on you, and what do you think about those people? For the audience that is listening who barely ever get to hear from people like you, would you tell us what you think of these terrorists and how you think that they have affected your life? Well, first and foremost, they affected the life of people they took away so savagely that day. From my perspective, my own personal perspective coming at it from a Muslim, the pain of, uh, of those lost of the terror that day, uh, the mourning that we were all doing together, uh, is compounded by another challenge, which is by virtue of calling ourselves Muslim, we were guilty by association. And so that was heart-wrenchingly difficult. And as a mother, even more so, as you grapple with trying to make sense of it all for two very innocent children. Yeah, your son was, what, uh, Taimur? Yeah, how, he how was old only was three, and my daughter uh, was just beginning kindergarten. And I remember, um, sadly, that her first day at school was actually the morning of 9-11, the first official day of kindergarten. And uh, I read about this in the book where I uh, packed a teeny miniature Quran in her backpack as a sort of um, a spiritual talismanic kind of protect my daughter thing. Uh, so that's like Christians carrying a cross. It is, yes. Sort of for protection. And it was a big oversized backpack with a teeny tiny Quran. And, um, as I watch the images of the horror of that day, of the buildings going up the flames, and, and thinking that the very same miniature Quran that had packed so lovingly in my daughter's backpack was being used to wreak the havoc and the hate and the destruction, yes. and the juxtaposition of those two realities um, was mind-numbing and confusing at a very existential level as a parenting le at a parenting level and so the journey has been for me a journey of learning and of owning my religion of understanding the issues and uh, empowering my children we can teach our children as American Muslim parents to disassociate disengage and say and I'm told this is uh, also true to the Jewish experience when you when you have stereotypes out there and you, you're trying to develop your identity in opposition to a stereotype, you can sort of say, well, you know, I'm not quite Muslim or I'm not quite, and I, yeah, and that. Yeah, people are changing names right now. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of, you know, people are shying away from, from celebrating or, or doing Ramadan in the office. Uh, pe people are, in, you know, closing up their identities. And that's a natural yeah. reaction. It's yeah. a very diff difficult journey, but it's one that I, I hope, and I do not know that I have made the right choice, but I think I have. I do feel like by taking my children along on this journey and insisting that they, not insist, because ultimately their choice, the choice is theirs. What I do is reveal. I take them along as we learn together. And slowly they have uh, chosen to self-identify as Muslims too. And I think that by doing that, I hope that they can hold both America um, accountable to its higher ideals as they can hold Islam accountable to its higher ideals, that they become living embodiments of what it means to be truly American and Muslim, and they can be agents of change for a better world. Well, I find it extremely profound that you chose to do this with your life, uh, because many people you know, there are two types of people, people of conscience, who actually take it upon themselves to create a change. And you have not only written a prior book called The Faith Club, which was very popular all over the United States. I remember every time I go lecture, there's always some little old lady who comes out and <laughs> says, The Faith Club, I think you were mentioned in The Faith Club. So now that was one book that you